Hello and welcome to today's Magical Learning webinar. My name is Danette Fenton Menzies and I'm the Director of Learning here at Magical Learning. And this month we're going to be talking about being a great leader. So what we're going to be covering in this particular webinar is what does it mean to be a great leader? So what is great leadership? Why is it important for all of us to strive to be great leaders? And for us, it doesn't matter where you are in an organisation. It's actually just about an attitude. And we'll talk about that later. And then some tools and techniques that can help you develop yourself as a leader. And welcome to those that are joining us live. I know also that a number of people um, watch the recordings afterwards as well. Um, so welcome. And as always, feel free to ask questions as we go. There is a chat box. So if you wiggle your mouse, you can generally find the toolbar and the chat box is where there are three dots. So if you click down on the three dots where it says more, you'll find the chat box and you can say hi to everyone. So welcome. And yeah, we're going to have fun on this one. I love leadership and particularly with all the disruption that we've seen over the last little while. This is an area where I think that if we all concentrate on developing ourselves, it is, it's, um, the world's a better place when we become better leaders. So for all of you, as I said, doesn't matter what level you are in an organisation, um, and even if you don't work, this applies for kids as well, it's that attitude of leadership that is really important. And boy, the world needs lots of leadership at the moment. So I hope this is helpful um, in terms of developing your leadership skill. Now, I always love quotes. And this one's by John Quincy Adams. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more and become more, you are a leader. And I really like that because it is about you know, your attitude, what you do and the impact that can have on others. And as I said, it doesn't matter about what level you are in an organisation. And if indeed, if you are in an organisation, it doesn't matter. You can be a leader wherever you are. Now, I love for people to sort of contribute when we run webinars. So I'm curious, in terms of um, when you've dealt with leaders or yourself as a leader, what do you think are some of the qualities that we um, you know, inherently know that great leaders have? So would we encourage those of you who are live today um, to put in the chat box um, what sort of qualities you think about when you think about great leaders? Thank you, Jez. Calm under stress. Yeah, that is so important. And yeah, the ability to speak well in public. Yes. Oh, Kathleen, I love that too. Patience. Absolutely. Because the moment we get frustrated, it's a bit like what Jez just said about the calm under stress. That patience encourages everyone to keep moving forward. If we're not calm, if we're not patient, then that obviously impacts those around us, not in a positive way. Thank you, Jennifer, as well. Create space for others to excel and shine. I love it. And in fact, your um, quote there, or your sharing there, Jennifer, I'm going to share a story that um, one, happened to one of my clients very recently around that. And thank you again, Kathleen. Flexibility. I'm loving this interaction. Thank you so much. <laughs> Makes my day when we get on a webinar and we, we have this interaction. So the story I wanted to share um, was a client of mine, a coaching client who She's a great leader um, from many, many different perspectives. There's a, um, an assessment tool we do. She's in the top 10% um, of global leaders and that's across 10,000 plus leaders. So she's a very, very um, good leader. She's worked on her leadership skills. And the thing I love about her, and it comes to Jennifer's quote, is that she sees her role really as to obviously grow herself and to then grow her people around them. So to create that space, as you said, Jennifer, so that others can excel and shine. Anyway, she was sharing this with another work colleague who was at the same level as her. And the other work colleague, who's also in a leadership position, went, why would you do that? They didn't get 
that whole thing that you, as you said there, Jennifer, that it is so important, not just to grow yourself, but also to create that space for others to be able to step up, to learn, to lead and to shine. And so what we're seeing is the old approach to leadership was, it was all about the leader, it was all about them. Um, and there was often quite a lot of ego involved. The new model of leadership is that everyone can be a leader and really great leadership is about growing yourself as a leader and growing those around you as well so that they're also leaders. So I love um, the fact that, you know, you already picked up on this and we're all on the same wavelength on that one. So when I talk about great leadership, I always think about it, as I just said before, about it's firstly, you need to grow yourself because, you know, Whatever your limit is, is going to be the limit that you can grow others around you. So it is really important to continuously develop our own leadership skills. And then it's about focusing on serving and growing others. And really the reason that this is so important, particularly at the moment, is that there is so much change, so much disruption, that more than anything, can all step up and be leaders. We're going to be able to cope as um, a globe. Don't you like that? A globe in global leadership. Um, we'll be able to do that because there'll be more of us who get that idea that I need to keep growing me and I need to be lifting others up. When we work together, we collaborate. We come up with much better answers than when it's just me trying to be the leader and trying to solve everything. And as we go through the tools and tips today, what you'll notice is a lot of it is about, first of all, growing yourself, but then how do I share this with others in order that we can work together on these difficult, um, complex problems and challenges that we have you know, globally. So I always love the phrase, if it's to be, it's up to me. And for all of us, we can all be leaders. There is, it's not that you've got a piece of paper, it literally is that attitude about how can I grow and how can I grow and serve others. Now the next bit, I love this, John F. Kennedy, leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. So I'd love for you to give yourself either a clap or a party dance to acknowledge the fact that today you've chosen to devote some time to growing and learning some new things about leadership. Because it's really easy to go, oh, well, there's you know, this stuff that's urgent or it's busy, I need to do it. But showing up and spending some time learning allows you to grow your leadership skills, which allows you to grow those around you in terms of their leadership skills too. For any of you who have attended any of our um, webinars, you'll know that we often talk about self-care. And for leadership, for me, this is, if, if we don't master this, everything else is sort of, you're not going to perform as well. One of the things that um, self-care does is, for me, it's like the fuel that you put in the high performance car. If we don't look after ourselves, then over time, what you'll notice is your energy starts to decline, your enthusiasm and your resilience. And when I'm coaching executives, and I have, um, CEOs all over the world that I coach, one of the things I'll notice is when they start a coaching session, I always check in and I'm like, oh, how are you today? And when their resilience is, is low, because I haven't been doing self-care, what they'll say to me, and pardon my swearing here, is Danette, everybody is pissing me off. They go, oh, interesting. I said, can you share, when was the last time you did something to look after yourself? I don't remember. And what they're telling me is that they've been really generous with other people and they've forgotten that simple thing that they need to fuel themselves first. We often talk about when we used to fly, when they would do the demonstration about the oxygen mask. Self-care is like that oxygen mask. So when the oxygen mask drops, we get instructed on the aeroplanes to put it on ourselves first before we share it with others. 
what happens is our resilience drops because we're not doing self-care is it is literally like the oxygen mask drops and instead of putting it on my face where i can then help others i start sharing it with everyone else first so it's like <laughs> And I run out of steam. And the, the indicator for me, and it, it doesn't matter what level you are, who you are, the moment you start to notice as people are annoying you, um, as I said earlier, they often use the word piss me off, so people are pissing me off. That is a pretty good indicator you've been really generous with others. However, you've forgotten yourself. A lot of people think um, that drop in resilience shows that they are um, weak. It has nothing to do with weakness. It has a lot to do with being really generous um, and forgetting to be generous to yourself first so that you can serve others. When we are fueled up through working on our self care, we know that we present at work as leaders um, and also in our private life more empathetic we make better decisions we make better judgment and this is why i talk about this tool on a lot of webinars because without this foundation all of the other tools and techniques we share with you they have far less effect if you are not fully resilient and if you haven't got a good habit around self-care so i'm curious in the chat box what sort of things do you do to make sure that you're looking after yourself and your resilience? And while you do that, I'm going to hydrate because that's really important. <laughs> Beautiful, Kathleen. And you, what I'm going to lead with is the whole thing about sleep. So it is so important to get plenty of sleep. That is probably the absolute foundational skill that when we master that, everything else becomes easier. Thank you, Jeez. You play guitar. Yeah, love the guitar. And for those that don't know, Jez is my son and he's amazing and he plays guitar. Pretty awesome. <laughs> so when we don't do self-care, it really is difficult to be a good leader because you're exhausted. Yeah, thank you, Kathleen. When go home, try and switch the office, yeah, off the office in um, your head. Yeah, so important. One of our daughters used to work with Lifeline, and one of the simple things they did is they'd come in um, and they'd take their shoes off before they started their shift, and then they'd put their, sh their shoes on just after they'd finished their shift. And that was how they transitioned from and left the work stuff at work and the home stuff at home. So I love that concept, Kathleen, that, you know, thinking about how do I make that differentiation between work and home? Because, again, part of good self-care is not just sleep. It's taking breaks it's having rest and part of that rest is that time at home you know to be able to look after yourself obviously eating good food so good food you know the more natural it is the better the lower in sugar the better because again one of the impacts sugar has on us particularly our brain is it actually sends uh, more of our blood flow to the fight or flight part so the survival mechanism Again, as a leader, that makes it more difficult for us to, one, maintain our good energy and be calm under pressure, and also um, to just make good decisions. Because if our blood flows more in the survival part, we don't have all of the blood flow we need in the thinking part of our brain to be able to think well. And our brain will always override the thinking if it detects that it's feeling low or it's threatened, it will always give more blood flow to the survival. And to do that, it strips money, strips money, strips blood away from the thinking part of our brain. So low sugar or no sugar is actually much better for us if we want to be great leaders. You'll notice every time I ask a question, I have a drink of water. Most people are quite dehydrated, particularly if you're working in an air conditioned office or an air conditioned home, because many of us are working from home. That ability to stay hydrated because so much of our body, it's about 80%, 70 to 80% of our body is water. Staying hydrated is really, really important. The other fundamental one is that ability to be able to do exercise. We know that when we move, we learn better. In fact, what they've now worked out is that back in cave people days, they would walk and they would share lessons. 
And so we actually learn better if we're moving. I have a treadmill desk at my desk. And while at the moment I'm not walking on it, I'm standing up. The more we can move, the more, again, that blood is circulating in our body. We also know that when you sweat, that your brain releases a protein called BDNF. And BDNF stands for brain-derived neurotropic factor. And what that is, is basically fertilizer for our brain. So when we sweat, we're actually growing the brain cells. So as a leader, we want to keep the, our beautiful brain working well. So again, exercise as part of self-care is a beautiful way of ensuring that we show up as our best selves each day. Very recently, I read a book, and it is such an amazing book, and it's called Breath. And in this particular book, they've looked at the function of breath, and there's now quite a lot of research about how important it is to breathe properly. And I'll share some of the insights from this book. For example, we know that when we primarily breathe through our mouth, that that actually um, collapses part of our windpipe, et cetera, because we're not developing the strength through using our nose. Our nose has hairs inside it to filter a lot of the pollution. So by breathing in and out through your nose, it actually does a whole stack of stuff to your benefit, not just now, but longer term. Also, one of the things that they've noticed is if you, um, you know, when they find people, say, that haven't been discovered by the world in jungles and stuff like that, when you look at them, their teeth are perfect. What they've discovered is when we started as farmers to farm the land and could cook things more, we didn't chew as much. And what they've discovered is chewing regularly, even if it's chewing gum throughout the day, actually helps widen your mouth over time and keep your teeth straighter. Really interesting stuff. That breath through the nose, the best breathing is 5.5 seconds in through your nose and then 5.5 seconds out through your nose. And just do that for a minute and you sort of center your body, which allows us to come back to that beautiful, calm, centered spot. And so one of the things I include in self-care that I think is so important for my leaders and all of my CEOs, they all do this, is they take some time each day to meditate. One, because meditation helps you to breathe slowly, which brings the blood flow back to the thinking part. Two, it calms our body, which allows us to, again, be calm under pressure. Now, meditation doesn't have to be sitting there for five hours, umming, and mm, it can be if you love that. It can be as simple as Googling a nature video and just watching that and breathing nice and regularly through your nose, 5.5 seconds in, 5.5 seconds out, for a minute or two while watching a nature video. And what you'll notice as you do that is you just come back to that beautiful, calm, centered spot. And for anyone that you are leading, inherently in their brain they will pick up that you are karma and for them they'll be far more likely to follow you particularly under pressure because they know you've got strategies to stay calm which means you have access to far more thinking than a person who's not calm under pressure so that book breath learned some amazing stuff the other thing that I see when people get self-care right as a leader is we see far less ego. Now, ego shows up in a whole stack of different ways. Inherently, what ego tells me about a leader when it comes onto on display is that they are scared. So I will always say to my clients, first time we do a coaching session, I'll say, this is what ego turns up like. And when it comes into the room in coaching, I'm going to ask you directly, what are you scared of? Because when they're scared, they're not using the thinking part of their brain as best they could. So some of the ways that you, and I'm sure you've experienced some um, leaders who have a bit of ego from time to time, they'll do things like they will um, judge, they'll deflect, um, They'll compare. None of those behaviours that are about collaborating and helping and lifting people up, as all of you said um, in your comments earlier. So if 
you know, you, you notice yourself perhaps blaming or judging or defending, comparing, etc. Just know that inherently that is our body's way of signaling we're a little bit fearful. As a leader, then the best thing we can do is come back to our breath and slow ourselves down. By doing that, again, the blood flow comes back here. We are far better as a leader. Now, any questions about that? Any thoughts in terms of self-care as a leader? Have you noticed perhaps for yourself that when you don't do self-care, your leadership perhaps suffers a little bit? If that has happened to you, just put a yes. I won't name anyone on this one, but if, if you've noticed, if you don't look after yourself, your leadership, your judgment, your empathy, et cetera, start to go down, then, yep, absolutely. Thank you for sharing. I won't name anyone on this one. Yes. <laughs> Me as well. It happens to all of us. And this is why self-care, if you don't do that, everything else we suggest today, it's going to be harder. And it won't be as effective because this is the fuel for your energy, for your empathy, for everything. So our second tool from my perspective is being able to focus. There's a lovely quote that says, he who chases two rabbits catches none. As a leader, each of us will have a couple of areas in our life that we're really good at. For example, while I'm an accountant by trade, I know people who can do that much better than me and there are things I can do that an accountant can't. So in our business, I don't do any of the accounting side other than look at the numbers at the end of each month. Instead, I know I value add in our business by learning new stuff, because that obviously helps when we're presenting new stuff, talking to our clients to make sure we're delivering exactly what they want. And the most important thing from my perspective is growing my team, because they're the next generation of leaders. And so that is such an important part of my role. Now, if I don't know where I value add, and I've seen this with a number of leaders, it's really easy to get distracted because if you don't know where you value add, everything looks like an opportunity. But if we can only do certain things really well, then once we understand them, that allows us to have greater impact. It also allows us to make sure that during the day, we focus our time on the stuff that's really important. And this comes to some things around focus. Once you know what you're really good at and where you value add, it's making sure that you focus your attention on those earlier during the day. Unless you're really a, a night owl, we now know that the best hours for being really effective for a lot of people are between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. So if we're going to do the really important work, that's the best time of the day for most people to get in and focus on them. That means we have to time block out time if we can. And if we don't, what happens is the important work gets bumped to the end of the day when we have less um, mental bandwidth to be able to deal with it. So again, we're not as effective as if we do it earlier on. Now, if that does happen to you from time to time, there is a hack for that. And it has to do with your exercise. My coach, a gentleman called Robin Sharma, introduced me to a concept called second wind workout. So in the afternoon, when you notice your energy starting to slump, he suggests that you get up and you just do a little bit of exercise. And that way the blood starts circulating again and you get that second breath so that your brain is able to deal with those really important things. So it's a really simple thing to do. Notice the slump, get up and move a little bit. That can be really helpful. Um, the other thing is we know that throughout the day, we make a lot of decisions. And when you look at a lot of high performing leaders, um, what you'll notice is that particularly guys, this is really interesting, they'll tend to wear the same things. And because what they've worked out is that if you have to stand there every morning and work out, what am I going to wear today? It actually takes away some of your bandwidth to make decisions later on. So people like um, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, um, I know Obama had two suits, so he just chose one of those two suits each day. 
that whole ability to make less decisions about things such as clothing to then be able to have more bandwidth to deal with the important stuff again can be really really helpful we know that making important decisions is much better in the morning again because you've got that bandwidth so that allows you to focus better to make good decisions i'm also currently reading a book called sense and it's by a gentleman called russell jones and in it he talks about how we are sensory creatures for example, if you walk into somewhere and you smell a smell from your childhood, it'll take you straight back to your childhood. Anyway, in this book, he discusses a heap of different topics, but one of them is work. And I thought as leaders, can we set up our senses so that we are more productive, more effective? And apparently we can. So for best accuracy and productivity, Working in a room that is red coloured or at least having, say, on your, your um, desk, a notebook that is red helps us with our ability to focus and be productive. The other thing is stimulating sense. So apparently cinnamon is the number one one to keep us focused, but anything that is fresh, so things such as peppermint scent or a citrus scent also help us to be able to focus better. Isn't that interesting? So a simple thing you can do, have maybe a red notebook and whether it's sipping peppermint tea, chewing um, cinnamon, apparently there's cinnamon tooth, um, not toothpaste, chewing gum, or having, whether it's a candle or something, not necessarily lit, but just smelling those beautiful scents. That allows us to focus on the areas where we as leaders value add. So I think that once you've got your self-care, thinking about what do I do that value adds and then making sure you focus most of your energy on those. And I would always say part of that focus should always be making sure we grow more leaders around us. What, um, and I'm just curious, in the chat box, is there anything else you do to improve your ability to focus? How do you set your day up? make sure that you're able to do that and again I'm just gonna have a quick drink of water while you put some answers in the chat box no, looks looks like we've covered them all Oh, I love that, Kathleen. That's actually beautiful. Personally, you pray before you go to work. It's a beautiful way to bring you back to that gorgeous centered and set your intention for the day too. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. The only other one I, I forgot to share was as much as possible, syncing your body clock to the, the day. I get up early and what I love to do is watch the sunrise because that natural light really does help me to stay focused. And my best hours are between 4am to about 8.30am. That's when I work best. So for me, I get up early. I love to watch that sunrise and often I've got most of my really important stuff done. And this morning I had a lovely conversation with another leader and in fact I was going to share and I did share um, well I'm going to share a story about what we discussed this morning on the next slide so for me because we need to grow ourselves and others we need to commit to lifelong learning this allows us to continue to grow and adapt and also to share those skills with those around us particularly during all of the disruption now that can look like what we're doing at the moment, being on a webinar. It can be watching a video, it can be reading a book, it can be listening to an audio book, a podcast. There are so many different ways we can continue to grow ourselves. One thing that I think is really important, and this is absolutely something that all of my um, executive clients do, and I absolutely encourage them to do this, is to journal. 
One of the ways that we learn is we need to learn about ourselves. We need to learn what are we strong at, but also what do we need to develop in ourselves? What are the things that trigger me for argument's sake? What are my blind spots? By journaling, you can start to learn to get to know yourself. So if you're triggered, journaling about that and then talking about, well, what is it that triggered me? Because a tri when you're triggered, it's often not the person in front of you that's really triggered you. They've just raised an issue that maybe you need to do some work on. So I always say, if someone triggers you, thank them because you've just learned as a leader another area to explore that maybe needs a little bit of spring cleaning. When we don't explore that, what happens is those we push down the emotions that just are simply telling us we need to, to learn about this. And when we push them down, they tend to come up at inopportune times. So I've seen some leaders where they haven't done the inner work through journaling and reflection, where under pressure, they do the exact opposite of what we talked about earlier. Under pressure, they become stressed, they become reactive, the ego comes out big time. And what they do is create a safe a space that isn't safe for their people now the moment that happens everyone's blood flow goes to the survival mechanism and instead of a, a team collaborating and working through a challenge it becomes each person for themselves so that inner reflection is absolutely important if we are going to continuously grow ourselves and others as leaders a lot of leaders either have a mentor or a coach, again, to help them reflect on those areas where maybe they have a bit of a blind spot or again, those triggers. This is also why I think assessments, whether it's doing an emotional intelligence assessment, a leadership assessment, to, again, it's some idea about yourself and learn some new things about yourself. Whether it is, this is a strength that I can leverage as a leader, or this is a development opportunity that as I work on it will you know, increase my leadership capacity and abilities even more. The other thing I think that is really important is that most of your best lessons as a leader will come in your worst times. And in those times when we fail, um, perhaps we lose a job, we um, end up in a relationship or out of a relationship that you know, we thought was going to be there for a long time and all of a sudden it's, it's broken up for argument's sake. Those really difficult times, when we journal and reflect on them, allow us to learn lessons that will make us stronger the next time something similar happens. And I often share this story, which is a couple of years ago, one of our business partners, um, a week before Christmas, went belly up. And that business partner took out 90% of our income overnight. And that, that lasted for quite some time. Now, when that happened, I don't think I was the best leader. I certainly didn't do all of the stuff I now know. But what I did as I reflected is I went, okay, I didn't do that as well as I could. What can I do differently next time? So when COVID happened this time, I was in a very different space. I was like, okay, there's opportunities here. How can we serve others and help them navigate this uncertainty? And so for me, while that was not a pleasant experience those years ago, it absolutely has made me a much better leader and also a much better human being, I believe. So as leaders, we should explore those failures, not try to hide them and go, oh, I don't want to experience that again. It is a fabulous learning opportunity. And then I would encourage you always to share what you're learning with those that you work with. Again, how we can grow other leaders. Now, the conversation I had with my friend who is a leader this morning was really interesting. So there is an assessment that we do, um, which is a leadership assessment. And this assessment shows whether a leader is mature under pressure or what they talk about, immature under pressure. And that means a mature leader under pressure will think really good thoughts. They'll think things such as, okay, what's the opportunity here? Who can I talk to who's probably been through this so I can get some good tips? So you'll notice that the language they're using is about, okay, there's an issue in front of me, but let's work out how we can move through that. 
a leader who perhaps hasn't developed that maturity in terms of thoughts and questions yet will often say under pressure, first of all, they'll get stressed, they'll um, do what we call derail, so they will um, perhaps lash out or run away. But th it's their thinking patterns that create all of that. And it's because their thoughts would be things such as, why me? Why does this always happen to me? You know, how can I make sure that this doesn't happen next time? Rather than going, okay, what can I learn from this? And who can I reach out to in order to be able to move forward? So that's why, again, journaling can be really helpful. And for me, I encourage all of my leaders, part of their growth is to collect great leadership questions. Because if we ask a great question, we're going to react to something in a far different way to someone that asks not a great question. So when we ask a great question, we generally can respond to chaos as opposed to react to chaos. So I love questions and I would encourage all of you to start a list of great leadership questions. My last one that I think for leaders is so important is no excuses. And no excuses is about, first of all, um, not using an excuse. The moment you use an excuse, you step back from your greatness. An excuse to is I'm a little bit scared, I'm not confident. Instead of stepping back, hold yourself to the highest level. Be accountable for what's going on. Face your fears because often they're not really real. It's just your, your brain try, or your mind trying to keep you safe. And it does that by saying, oh, no, you, you couldn't do that. You couldn't possibly do that. Oh, no, don't do that. Don't listen to that. And again, that's why journaling can be really helpful and why meditation, because you can hear that chatter and let it go. Part of the big fear that a lot of people have is they don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want to feel like people will catch them out and go, oh, you really don't. You're not a leader. You don't know what you're talking about. We're all leaders. We might be at different levels. That's okay. But don't let those fears talk you out of your greatness. So notice if you are making excuses. Be prepared to ask for help. And for a lot of people, that's a scary thing to do. The more you do it, but you'll find those that are really generous and, and these are the leaders that are you know, lifting people up and getting them to shine. People who say no, it might, they might be really busy. They may not also be the right person to help you. Keep asking. Don't take one no as everyone's going to say no. The other thing is basically looking at where am I strong, keep working on those, but also where are my triggers, my blind spots, my development areas, and being brave enough to work on those. Because often those areas are a bit more emotional and we tend to shy away from them. But in fact, when we master them, it makes us great. What I've seen with some leaders is a lot of people don't like conflict. What happens then is that unless they lean in to that fear of having difficult conversations, they tend to avoid. And it shows up in the emotional intelligence trait of straightforwardness. When a leader is straightforward, they will have that difficult conversation. The other person won't be um, going, I don't know what I need to do. I don't really understand what that was about. When people aren't straightforward, what happens is they put politeness ahead of directness. The problem is it's like going around the merry-go-round five million times, but the person's like, I don't really understand what I need to change. All of us need feedback in order to grow. As a great leader, we need to first seek feedback for ourselves and what we can grow. And we also need to be brave enough to share that feedback with others as well, so that we allow them to grow and shine. Where we don't do that, we waste time, we waste energy. And often then what you'll see is when a leader's not prepared to do those difficult conversations, it'll end up with people um, being disillusioned with the organization and they'll often leave or they may even be sacked and the organisation will blame the person rather than actually looking at itself and going, 
did we actually give them the feedback to improve so that they could move forward? That is a skill being straightforward that I think um, pretty much most people could do a little bit more on. So I'm curious, you know, what do you do to try and make sure that you have, you don't give excuses so that you, you do what you say you're going to do? What are some of your ways of making sure you can do that? In the chat box, I'd love for you to share any, any tools, tips you do with that one. For me, one I'm learning is because now I know where I'm really good at and where I value add, I'm starting to get better at my boundaries by using the simple phrase, no. When we say yes to everything because we want to make sure that people are happy, etc., the problem is over time we start to um, not be as focused and we'll tend to take on too much, which means we tend to then give excuses or we run ourselves ragged and we stop doing that self-care. So learning to be able to say no to certain things is also really important as a leader. Again, I love quotes. Jim Rohn, an amazing motivational speaker. The challenge of leadership is to be strong, but not rude. Be kind, but not weak. Be bold, but not a bully. Be thoughtful, but not lazy. Be humble, but not timid. Be proud, but not arrogant. Have humour, but without folly. Beautiful way of describing it. Yeah, look, Kathleen, thank you for sharing that too. Boss says, pick your battles. Absolutely. And that is important. As leaders, we need to think, you know, where do we put that effort? Where don't we? Now, I'm curious, what one or two things might you be going to do differently following this webinar in terms of developing yourself as a great leader? In the chat box, I'd love for you to share just one or two things you're going to do different. Excellent. Thank you, Jez. Nature meditation is such a beautiful one. I love, love, love that one. And less sugar. Beautiful. I'm very blessed. My nature meditation happens. I get to walk outside. Living on a farm, it's just beautiful. All right. So as always, there is a number of resources that we will share with you. So everyone will get a recording of this particular webinar and you'll get a copy of the slides with the resources. I just want to check in before we finish up for today. Um, and thank you, Kathleen. Think um, as a new leader, we all need a mentor. Absolutely. So thinking of someone you admire and then just having a chat to them, you know, would you mind mentoring me? It's really, it's a great way. And then over time, Kathleen, you will also, I'm sure, be mentoring others as well. So I'm going to share one final hack or tool that you can use as a leader. The moment you feel like there's pressure and you're not really sure you're going to cope with it, you can do a really simple hack to your brain. If you put a pen between your mouth, between your teeth, sorry, and smile, what that does is it tricks your brain into believing that it's, it's safer than your brain has been telling you. So when we smile, the blood flow goes back to the front of our brain and increases our brain prof proficiency by up to 31%. And the other thing I do in that situation is I use a beautiful phrase that Ben Zander taught me and he's got a lovely TED talk. And instead of going, ah, he goes, how fascinating. And again, when we instruct our brain how fascinating and you're smiling, your brain goes, okay, I've got this. I can move forward. So I hope today's um, webinar has been really helpful. We are not doing a webinar in December because we figured it's Christmas time and it's, it's quite busy. We will start back and I think we're going to change the format a little bit in the new year. So we'd love any feedback that you have. In in the meantime, we will be sharing more content and throughout this month, we will be focusing on leadership. Um, so any of our social media, um, we'll, you'll be getting articles, videos, etc., to help grow you as a leader. So we do encourage you to follow us on um, at least one social media channel. 
I'd love to say thank you very much for turning up today. And I wish you a magical rest of the week. And until next time, happy holidays over the season. And we look forward to talking next year again on another webinar. In between, we've got podcasts as well you might be interested in. So have a great rest of the day and week. Bye, everyone. Thank you.